right at the lead. He speaks widely on topics that include cells as living computers, life science as an emerging IT industry, and biological safety and security. He's given dozens of invited talks related to synthetic biology and life science. No Thank you. Further ado, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. It's always tough in the morning because you guys haven't had the coffee get into your bloodstream yet. Ah, so yesterday is big data, the new oil. I go, no, 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 no. Small is the new big data. And I'll, I'll try and explain why. Let's see if this goes. So Craig gave you a little bit of a taste of what I do. I'm a microbiologist and a geneticist which means basically I'm really boring at parties. <laughs> all the stuff that I do is invisible. All the stuff that I work with, people can't see, can't relate to it, generally don't understand it. Doesn't seem to apply to them. Can't go buy it at the store and go work with it. I've also worked with computers most of my life because this type of technology, genetics, microbiology, health data, all runs on computers. And people love computers. I know that. That's why we're all here. I'm also an Autodesk researcher. I joined them this year. I'll tell you why. My, I, just want, I just want to be clear that my ideas are not necessarily representative of the company. A little disclaimer. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit of why I'm with them in the course of the talk. If you don't know Autodesk, they make design software. And I think you'll see why they're, they're starting to be relevant in life science soon. Robin invited me, though, because we both uh, share a common connection with Singularity University. And if you don't know Singularity University, it's a new <coughs> university, a startup, that was founded in 2009. And its whole focus is on exponential technologies, technologies that are doubling in a really short period of time, really quickly. I was fortunate that when Singularity was starting to organize, people that were in the room in the founders meeting were tweeting, not tweeting, but they were sending me emails and photographs that, that said, Andrew, you'd love this because I'm kind of a big data junkie. And I found myself becoming faculty with this university at the beginning of 2009 and writing their life science program. So it's been a total blast. I just stepped away from them as co-chair of bioinformatics and biotechnology just a few months ago so I could work with Autodesk full time. But I'm still faculty. The thing I like about Singularity University is it's located at NASA Ames, so I get to hang out with astronauts all the time. <laughs> And these guys are real big data crunchers, too. They're NASA's big supercomputing center. And really, how many schools have their own airstrip and blink, blimp hangar? <laughs> Exponentials. Like, we all know exponential technologies in the computer business. That's, we live and breathe it. It's what gets us up every morning and drives us. It all started with this little puppy, the first transistor. It didn't take all that long. This was what, 1947, 1948? Semiconductors changed the world in the 1970s. These things, we're still riding the exponentials. The web, who saw that coming? <laughs> I, when I first got on the web, it was 1990. And it was a primary religious experience for me. And the reason why is because I'd lived in my head all my life. As a, when you start training in molecular biology, you see all this stuff in your head. You can't see it really on screen. So you have this really vivid imagination. And when I first got on the web, I saw the web. And I saw the potentials of it. And I never looked back. The web today connects us. It shows how we're connected as people. It's giving us tremendous new perspectives on our planet everywhere. And the, it crosses into my world these days with three words, RIP, MOD, and FAB, otherwise known as Scan, Modify, Print. 
This is really what ignited computers for most people. Word processing. It's literally scan, modify, print in two dimensions. This revolutionized the way we, we created words and shared them. It was really the biggest revolution since the printing press. Now we're going 3D with all this stuff. You know this. This is Autodesk's office in Toronto. The whole building's been scanned. The whole, all the building informations are connected online. We, it's literally a living, breathing building when it, turns, when it comes to electronics. We're doing this with everything. This is an actor being scanned in a rig for movies. Absolutely photorealistic today, as you know, from watching a lot of the CGI effects in movies. This is from a meetup last week where a group of people went to the San Francisco Asian Art Museum with just their cell phones and they scanned various exhibits with software just on their cell phones. And even though these artifacts are often behind glass, you can get great scans with them. You can convert them in the cloud to point clouds and they started printing them literally just a few hours later. This is, it was a scan mob. And you're going to see more and more of this happening in the world around us. Not only is it just scanning, they're mashing it up. This is an iPhone case with one of the pieces from, from the exhibits, made just an hour later, and printed it on a phone. This is my friend, Jean Pablo, who has a number of these 3D printers, maker bots, et cetera. They cost about $1,000. And he's been working with museums and other groups, making artifacts for years with these technologies. Which, if you've seen the new Wired magazine this month, you realize rip, mob, and mod, and fab is starting to affect everyone's lives. It's getting affordable. This is changing manufacturing on a global scale. Kids love this stuff, by the way. If you're looking for the perfect gift to give your kids this Christmas, go check on some of these 3D printers. And if you know you just if you like to buy stocks, check out DDD on the stock market. We know that everything is going online because it's just so cheap to put things online. So what we're really doing is building a nervous system for the world. We're building a global brain. You know, the last mile happens in biology too. It literally goes to every sensory nerve ending. We're doing that for the entire planet. I don't know what that means in the long run because my brain is too tiny. I can't crunch all this data. That's why you guys are here. We're even extending this off planet. I saw a presentation by an astronaut last week, a guy named Ed Liu, fascinating guy. He was putting up a new telescope. This is the design that's meant to look for asteroids that could hit Earth. So this is scanning our solar system. It's pretty remarkable. NASA was too slow doing it, so he created a private foundation. It turns out that putting up a space telescope, making a space telescope, getting it up there now, is about the same price as adding a new wing on an art museum in a major city. So he just said, let's go do it. Pretty fascinating. But I want to pull you into my world, which is the world of biology. And I like to say that biology, life, that's the first exponential technology. Computers, eh, took a while to get here. This is a living, breathing planet. And we can hitch a ride on the International Space Station and fly over, and we can see how we've affected the planet. You know, we light it up at night. That's light pollution, by the way. But we can see how we've changed the world. But really, this is a living world. And sometimes we kind of forget that because 
you know, we play with a lot of human technologies today. If you take telescopes and turn them around, they become microscopes. We always knew that the stars were there, you know, but we really didn't know that micro, microbes existed until about 400 years ago. And there's a lot of them out there, out of sight, out of mind. But really, it's as far down as we can look. Everywhere on the planet, there are microbes. So I'm a microbiologist. This is my first love. I want everyone to start getting an appreciation of some of these microbes in the same way that they have a, an appreciation of computers today. This is just a little worm. It's probably about a thousand cells. And it's just one, some of the most beautiful stuff I've ever seen. You can actually see a piece of food in its head swirling around. It ate it, but it's not dead yet. This is a face of a spider. You know, it's complicated. This is the luscious lips of a housefly. I know. <laughs> Angelina Jolie, <laughs> eat your heart out. This is my favorite organism, though. It's E. coli, and I know, I know, I know, E. coli's got a bad rap in Alberta today. <laughs> but that's just one particular strain of E. coli. Your whole body's filled with E. coli. This is what digests your food. We have a symbiotic relationship with these organisms, and the vast majority of them don't hurt you. But I love these little guys because they teach us so much. They're one of the most common research organisms. For years, I've been going around saying that cells are little computers. Not the same as the electronic computers that we have, because those are kind of hmm, simplistic. We like to think they're high tech, but in fact, they're kind of low tech. But and I can kind of prove this. I don't like going into a lot of scientific papers and discussion. Really, the best way to show you how advanced a cell is, is to show you what it does. What we know today, though, is that the architectures of cells and computers are actually really similar. We all know computers now. We've grown up with them. Whole generations have grown up with them. But the biologists are mapping the architectures of the cell onto computing, which means basically I can go to any kid today and talk biology in a language they understand. We're getting a whole new generation of life scientists that really thinks about cells like computers. And the cool thing is, it doesn't really matter whether you engineer something or you evolve it, it's kind of going towards the same, mm, this, it kind of gets to the same place, because really you want it to work, you want it robust, you want it to be low energy, you want it to, so you, you really try and have the same design goals. But this is what makes, really distinguishes cells from computers. Cells can self-manufacture. This is really remarkable. This is just a classic film of bacteria dividing. You start with one bacteria and you end up with billions overnight. None of our computers do that right now. None of our chips do that. But down the road, they probably will. So I don't say cells are computers anymore. What I say is that cells are fabs. They're factories. They can make more of themselves. They're like 3D printers mm, without 3D printers. This is really remarkable. And it's all powered by DNA. DNA is the software for all living things. It's software that makes hardware, which is really remarkable. Another classic picture, just a, one of those E. coli cells squashed like you stepped on it with your shoe, and its genome has come out. Five megabits of information written in DNA. I saw that. DNA is a programming language. It's literally like the same code you would send to a 3D printer to say, go take this object I just scanned and make it real. 
It's a whole different paradigm in software development, and we're still just getting, we, we're still wrapping our brains around it. We've never had software that could direct its own hardware. All the same stuff that I just showed you with 3D, with scanning the world and modifying it with software tools and printing it is coming to biology though. It's coming to the molecular world. It's coming to living systems. And it's one of the biggest shifts we've ever seen. Computing is probably the only other thing that's changed the world as much as this technology coming online. Ripping in my world is just DNA sequencing. All it does is read the code of a genome. We made this automated quite a while ago. This is, this is an old factory for reading DNA code. You load the plates in that are on the lower right hand corner and they just get run by these robots and all the data just flows into computing systems. Massive amounts of data. You got about six gigabytes per genome, but these things just spew out data. You can see the size of the cabling. All this stuff is going to desktops. This is a desktop DNA sequencer that came out a couple of years ago. They give them away now, but they're like 50 grand. Here's the latest model. It's about 150,000. It'll do a human genome in an afternoon. It's the heart of it is a little chip, literally an electronic chip that has a reaction chamber on top. And it looks at the sequencing reactions in real time using electronics. It's literally the fusion of Gordon Moore and life science. It's really wild. This is where it's going though. This is a USB stick size synthesizer or sequencer that's disposable. This comes online early next year, and it's just going to keep getting smaller and smaller. You see where this is going? It'll be in your cell phone. <laughs> It'll cost virtually nothing. This technology has dropped in price so fast, it's, it's astounding. Twelve years ago, the first human genome cost over three billion dollars to create. It took an international effort over ten years. Now it's benchtop thing. It's under $1,000. Next year, it'll be under 500. And you can kind of get a sense hmm, that we're not quite prepared for that. How many people here wake up in the morning and go, man, I want a genome sequenced? <laughs> Doesn't happen yet. It's actually changing faster than our imaginations can keep up. Our imaginations. Some people are already there. China, in this one shop called BGI, used to stand for Beijing Genomics Institute. It doesn't anymore because it's not in Beijing, it's in Shenzhen. These guys understand sequencing. They've got a 3M project, 3 million genomes, 1 million human genomes, 1 million ecosystems, 1 million plant and animal. And that's just the start. Really, we're going to sequence everything many times. If it tastes good, we'll sequence it. If it's cute, we'll sequence it. We're just going to sequence everything we can get our hands on that's alive. And that's really the big data that's going to start flowing into your systems from the biological world. Moore's law is already the bottleneck. It costs less to sequence a base of DNA than to write it and store it on a hard drive and compute it today. And this is still accelerating at four to five times Moore's law. In other words, we already know when we should be throwing away data. It's right after we're done with it because it'll be cheaper to go back and sequence it. And it's not just DNA code. It's all things health related. I, the founders of Singularity University are also closely associated with a group called the X Prize. They hang out big $10 million prizes on stuff that should be done. And one of the things that really should be done is that your cell phone should be good at diagnosing when you're sick. Because it's hard to go get a doctor's appointment and, and these things are with you all the time and they're watching you. So there's a $10 million prize on right now 
to make your doctor, uh, to make your cell phone as smart as your doctor. Kind of cool. It's going to be taking a lot of information about you and your life and integrating it all the time. So really, biology and electronics are starting to fuse. And I'm not going to talk too much about mod, because really mod is just crunching this data, and you guys are the pros at that. You're building the tools that are needed to go and take a lot of this data and turn it into knowledge. That's going to be a big job. It's going to take a while. This is one of the tools that I was really happy to be a part of seeing it created. This is a genome editor. It allows people to start designing DNA. Genome compiler, it's called. And really, there's other genome compile tools. But the thing I like about this one is it's starting to get really easy to use, drag and drop. So I can teach kids to use it really fast. But there's still a problem with it in the sense that it still has genetic code, ATGC kind of you know, displayed there. How many of you still program computers in zeros and ones? No, we don't do that anymore. So the tools for modding genomes and for modding life and for manipulating all this stuff really need to go through a few more rounds of evolution. It'll come. The fab side is where it's really getting fun, though. Fab is starting to change. And I think my batteries are starting to wear out here. Fab is, this is how we did fab in biology. I imagine most of you spend your time surrounded by computers and screens. Mm. Most of the life scientists I've worked with, this was their life. Life science was kind of like cooking, only a little more complicated. And doing the dishes really sucked. This is a typical lab. It's not all that long ago. Liquid handling devices, pipettes, plasticware, reagents. It was big business. I was really fortunate. I went to school in Calgary, and I was hired away by a company that made this drug. This is a little hormone called erythropoietin. It tells your bone marrow, go and make blood cells, red blood cells. It's really good for anemia. It's really good if you have cancer and you need to start turning this out. It can save you a transfusion. It's 193 amino acids, which means it's under 600 base pairs of DNA code. And this was one of the biggest selling drugs in the world. Billions and billions of dollars under for 600 bases. I don't even think computers do that. How many 600-bit programs made billions of dollars? Really cool. The thing is, the state of the art in the industry is still about 10,000 bits. Not very big, even after 20 years. Today, there's tools like this, companies like this, DNA 2.0. They make printers for DNA. I love these guys. I go there, it's like, it's like you ever go to a place where they're assembling cars, just the assembly lines? This is an assembly line for DNA. It's just robots. The CEO just laughs. He goes, the robots run the company. I don't have to do anything. An order comes in, all these automated synthesizers start printing DNA, and then they assemble it, do quality control, and they ship it out to their customers. Super cool. This is molecular manufacturing. So the cool thing is, if you can type, and I believe all of you can, you can be a genetic scientist. Just, you'll have to learn a little bit about genetics to be a good one. But you're already equipped, and that's so cool. This is what you get back from a group like DNA 2.0. You get a, a little, that wispy stuff in the tube is DNA, just in a bit of buffer. That's actually a genetic program that you can run in cells. And people do. The first program that was ever synthetically made complete was a poliovirus genome. 
10 years ago. It took the researchers that did this in New York over a year, about a year and a half to synthesize and about a half million dollars all in to make 7,500 base pairs of code and boot it up in the lab. And it was pretty provocative because it is, after all, polio virus. But they proved the point. Synthetic DNA can be used to boot up and run in biological systems. Kind of cool. A few months later, another group came along and made it another little virus. How interesting. You can actually use electronic software to go and make biological software. These guys kind of changed the world in 2010. The guy on the left is a guy named Craig Venter. He's probably the only living scientist that most people can recognize. No, seriously, if you Google top 10 scientists, they're all dead. I'm not kidding. You go around and ask people, can you name a living scientist? Most people can't, unless they happen to know someone in science. And they go, oh, my cousin Bob. <laughs> the guy on the right won a Nobel Prize in genetics. And these guys paired up to write synthetic genomes. And they wrote this little guy in 2010. It's about a million base pairs. It's the genome of a small bacterium. They didn't create it from scratch. They copied it from nature. And they added little bits of code into the genome that basically they signed their name, they put their email address, and they put a couple of quotes into the genome because we've got a Rosetta so we can write English into DNA. ASCII. <laughs> And they booted up this little organism. This is actually about a billion cells all in a group. And they changed the world. This is the first synthetic free living life form. They made headlines all over the world. But really, it doesn't look like much. But it's marking the, the start of a whole new field of life science where you get to program living things. Really cool. The day he booted it up, he got a phone call from the president saying congratulations. He also got a phone call from the pope who said congratulations. Kind of odd, eh? You, you try doing that at work. <laughs> Meanwhile, the president turned around and said, oh, he did it. Get me a report on what this means. And six months later, this came out. Basically, all the genetic scientists were streaming into Washington for six months, giving testimony so that they could figure out the ethical implications of this new technology. But really, it's just genetic engineering, just genetic engineering, only done with digital tools, so now everybody can do it. The short story on the report is they said, look, we've been doing genetic engineering for 40 years, and we're pretty comfortable with it. We've already got most of the stuff in place to make sure it's safe. Let's just revisit it in 18 months. This is the start of something I like to call digital biology. And it really does fuse our worlds together. It also means we have to change the way we think about biology. Because if you ever took that bio class in high school, you remember what biology was all about. It was about Dissection, taking things apart. Well, the cell is the most complicated mechanism in the known universe. And taking it apart and laying out all the pieces really doesn't tell you how it all comes together and works. So we've started training a whole new generation of researcher that like to put stuff together and take it out for a spin. We use the code, the genetic code, in the same way that a programmer writes code today. They start with little blocks of it, and they start stringing those blocks together. And they reuse those blocks because they know the ones that work. Here's a couple of students that were working to make E. coli bacteria glow really, really bright. They were actually hacking this enzyme that made it glow, but they wanted it to glow super bright. And why were they doing it? They said one day they want trees. 
to replace street lamps. At night, they start to glow. They turn off during the daytime. Kind of cool. There are now 10,000 students that have gone through this program that was started by MIT to train people in modular, open source genetic engineering. It's called synthetic biology. And it's really the start of something that I think is going to keep growing and change the world. My friend Christian over here actually led a team, has led teams at the University of Calgary since 2006, seven? So, you know, it's right here in Alberta's backyard. I was really fortunate. I came to Alberta in 2007 to give a couple of talks here, and the government was so excited, they said, go, go everywhere in the province and tell this story. And all the universities here started to pick up this technology and run with it. And our students went to MIT, they competed, and they won prizes. They're, they're among the best in the world. If you ever saw the kids that went through these programs, you would, you'd be so excited. Because it's like, it's like going to a sports game. They literally get into it. And this is, this is like uber geeky. <laughs> but it's so powerful. It's the same thrill I got the very first time I sat down with a computer. Probably the same thrill you got with a computer. And the fun thing is, these guys, these students with proper mentorship, are as good as the best biotech companies in the world. This was from the winning team last year. They're about to just going into their semifinals and finals now. But this is from last year. And they didn't do one project in four months on a small budget during the summer. They did three. And each of them were world class. This was the University of Washington. They made biofuels, a really good biofuel. They improved the actual tools and technologies significantly that they were using, because this is recursive. They just keep getting better. And they made an enzyme for digesting gluten that was 800 times more effective than one the pharma industry had in clinical trials. Wow. In four months. These are getting spun out. The gluten destruction enzyme is already being spun out as a company. Notice that we've got Osley represented here, the Oil Sands Leadership Initiative, because in 2009, I was fortunate enough to work with them, and they got so excited about this technology, they became a major funder of it. They said, it's great. It educates the next generation. This is why the kids do it, though, for their own experience. And so they can get their name on what is essentially the Stanley Cup of genetic engineering. <laughs> it's really cool. And it's international. There's about 200 teams now all around the world doing this. I love telling this story. Most people don't even know. 200 universities. And it's moving into high schools. This is why it's just going to keep accelerating, too. The blue line is the cost of reading DNA, which you know went from billions of dollars to something you can put on your credit card. And the yellow and orange lines are basically the cost of writing DNA. And you don't see it here, but in 2013, that's going to drop by a few orders of magnitude. Right now, you get about five bases of DNA per dollar, five, five bits per buck. It's going to go up into 10 to 20,000 bits per dollar in the next few years. <laughs> it's like, wow. Remember. The company I worked for made billions off of under 1,000 base pairs of code. There's already little startup companies like this one popping up. I was here a couple weeks ago. It's in Boston. Everyone that works there is under 30 years old. It's filled with living creatures, plants and jellyfish and fish and other things, turtles. And they make living organisms. This is a commercial fab. And right now, they do it by contract. But in their first year of operation, they won millions of dollars worth of contracts. And they're funded by some of the best people in the world. On a more professional level, there's this company 
synthetic genomics. I don't know what the valuation is because it's still private, but these guys are amazing. They're working on biofuels and vaccines. Their offices are in La Jolla. They've, in May, they purchased an 81-acre site. They're starting to get ready to scale things a little. It's really, this is fascinating technology. One day this company will go public. I don't know if it'll beat your expectations, but it's certainly one to watch. And it's also being done by the academic community, biofabs. They're kind of like kinkos, only for genetic engineering. You send them a file, you get your output. This is so exciting for me. Still early days. But I watch the biofab really closely because when they get it all figured out, I'm going to go make a commercial version of it. <laughs> and if you think this is all just big companies or you have to be a multinational corporation or you have to be rich, think again. There is another organization called Do-It-Yourself Biology that started up in 2008. And now they have thousands of members. And these guys just do it for the fun of it. A few of them started making home labs. This was one in Menlo Park that was doing cancer research. They were buying equipment from, from auctions, repairing it, getting it up and running. They ended up being funded for millions of dollars and moving in, becoming a legitimate business. We're starting to see the appearance of con community labs. This one's in New York. It's called GenSpace. There's one in San Francisco called BioCurious. And they're starting to pop up in other places, too. This is really grassroots biotech in the same way that you know, some of you may have been hacking together electronics when you were young. This is one of my favorite guys. He's based out of Ireland. And he actually runs a legitimate licensed biotech out of his bedroom. And he uses these genetic engineering technologies to design different things that he sells. They're open source, but he makes them and sells them. And he says, you know, it cost me $1,500 to go and synthesize the DNA, but after I'm selling it for like $50, after I sell 30, it's all profit. He's, he understands the business model here. But it's spilling out even further than that. This is a screenshot from a game called Fold It. And it's about protein folding, which is really, really tricky to do. At, in the pharma companies, we used to spend a fortune on this stuff. But they made a game out of it, and now they literally mine the world for people that just kind of do it naturally. And you know what? It's solving major, major scientific breakthroughs. This is just the start. This is really just the beginning of crowdsourcing in the life science space. This is one that I really love. I champion this one because these guys do what big pharma companies can't. Turns out that a lot of, you know, sometimes you've got a kid and you know there's something wrong with them genetically, you just don't know what. What could, you couldn't do anything before. Your doctor would just scratch their head and try and treat them. These guys, what they do is they say, look, that's a rare genetic disorder. They get a bunch of genetic scientists to commit some time. And then they crowdsource the kid. And they raise money per child to go and get the genome sequencing done and to buy some coffee and donuts, I guess. And then they analyze the genomes and they solve the molecular problems so that they can start figuring out what they need to make a drug for or what they need to look for. This is so amazing. This just couldn't have been done even 10 years ago. I contribute to stuff like this. I think this is, this is my favorite charity because this is literally, you know, like, can you just imagine how traumatic it is for parents, you know, that you, when you don't know what's wrong with your child? Now we have the state-of-the-art tools to do this. So this is called rare genomics. And it's, it's brilliant. What happens after this, though, is where it really gets fun. 
because I'm just talking about scanning and analyzing. When you get to writing it kind of crowdsourced in a bigger way, it gets really interesting. This is a picture of baker's yeast. Now, when I say bacteria, you go kind of go, ugh, 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 bacteria. Because we all think bacteria are bad. They're not, but that's kind of what the marketing spin is. But when I say yeast, you go, mmm, bread, beer, mmm. Did you see the Discovery Show where they said beer essentially started civilization? <laughs> that it led to language, that it was the, started the first agriculture, that it produced the first antibiotics, that it purified water, that it created the economies that allowed the pyramids to be built. I love this. Beer powers the world. We know this. <laughs> beer. Beer, of course, it's all yeast. There is a project on right now to make a fully synthetic yeast. In other words, this is the next upgrade from the bacterium. It'll take them a few years, but when this is done, it's a really big breakthrough because yeast are close to us. We're, they basically have, yeast have the same chromosomal structure and they're really, really easy to genetically engineer. <coughs> Plus, we know what to do with them. Make beer, make bread, make sourdough. They've already shown that you can make synthetic bits of the chromosomes. So this isn't a pie in the sky project. This is just getting down and doing the work of making a fully synthetic yeast. And of course, I told you it went from billions of dollars to about a thousand to read genomes. It's going to go from a lot of money to next to nothing to write them. Because think about it, every time one of your cells divides, it writes a human genome. It doesn't charge you. DNA and human genomes are really cheap. Same with yeast genomes. So we're going to have some really, really interesting beers coming out. <laughs> because all the stuff from mushrooms and plants and other things are going to be ported to yeast. We've already ported the opiate drugs. In other words, you don't have to grow fields of poppies anymore to go and make things like morphine. And more and more stuff is going to get ported to this organism, and that's really going to drive the DEA crazy, because all yeasts kind of look the same. Why do, why do I get so excited about this stuff? Why is it important? Well, because this is you know, kind of the consequences of an industrial world. Things we don't see quite so much here because we're not manufacturing a lot in North America anymore. But it's a dirty business. This is China. I've been to beaches like this in the last few years. In places like Indonesia and Thailand. Just plastic washes ashore. It's all junk. We already know we're straining our oceans whether it's the big plastic gyre or whether it's overstressing our fisheries. Oceans are kind of the lifeblood of the planet. We need them. And of course, just our landfills are, are bulging. Mexico cities run out. They just keep throwing it in anyway. Toronto trucks it into the US. I don't know where they do it here, but I'm sure they have to haul it far away from our cities because we don't like living with our trash. We have, to, we have to change our ways pretty soon. This is a picture by a photographer, Chris Jordan, who went to Midway Island in 2009. And Midway is really midway in the ocean. There's nothing around for thousands of miles. And he just photographed albatrosses that had died because they had gone and eaten plastic stuff out of the ocean. And he has hundreds of pictures like this. And it really just makes you go, whoa, we need to change. And I throw this one in for the space geeks. <laughs> We're polluting orbit, too. Of course, this is not drawn to scale. But still, every piece <laughs> is going over 17,000 miles per hour. And a paint flake can kill you. Ah, oh, it's crazy. So. 
We don't even know how many people we're going to have on the planet in 40 years. That's a pretty wide margin of error between the green line and the red line. I tend to think we'll be closer to the red line because we're getting, we're still filling up the planet. And I, we're optimists. This is how we go and get energy today. And if you haven't been up to the oil sands, I highly recommend it. I really do. It's the most impressive mining operations I've seen anywhere on the planet. And it's right here in our backyard, and it's why Alberta's really such innovators and why there's so much data flowing into a lot of the systems here. This is how we make chemicals. Again, remarkable stuff. Pinnacles of human innovation. But this is how plants capture energy. Just these little things called chloroplasts. It's what makes everything green, and it's really what powers the world. And then we have things like algae, one of the fastest growing little single-celled organisms, already photosynthetic and incredible biomanufacturers. It's going to change the way we make everything over the next 40 years. Photosynthesis is just a gene module that you can drop it into other organisms. All the other manufacturing capabilities of everything living can be put into things like algae and yeast. The cool thing is when you can suck carbon out of the air to make stuff and turn it into stuff that doesn't get burned, gets solid, you've captured that carbon for as long as that object exists. I worked with the oil industry in 2009. I said, thank you. And they said, why? And I said, because you've made it possible for the world to manufacture stuff using this technology without ever having to drill a hole in the ground. You guys look down, and that's where you see carbon. The rest of the world is going to start looking up. And we're going to manufacture so much stuff over the next 40 years using this technology, because it self-assembles, that probably by 2050 we'll be asking the oil industry if they could please put some more carbon up there for everyone. Please? That's the way I see it. Maybe you don't. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll be your kids that see that. But the White House is already looking at the bioeconomy as a major pillar of the, of literally, of growth for the next decades. Computing starting to taper off a little bit, just a little. This stuff is just getting rolling. Where does it go in the future? Oh, I love this. Viruses, lots of viruses. This is really scary stuff in some ways, but viruses are biological software. So it's said that I founded a cooperative biotech company. Turns out that the problem with a lot of biotech is they haven't really figured out a business model that's sustainable. They, in fact, they haven't figured out a business model that makes them a technology. So it's not really biotech. Tech gets faster and cheaper. Mm. Mm. Drug development actually has been getting exponentially worse for 60 years. So I changed the business model. I just made it a co-op, like mountain equipment co-op. I said, I'm just going to go take viruses, and I'm going to train them to go kill cancer cells. And people said, you're crazy. But really, people already use viruses for a lot of things. This company uses viruses to turn methane into ethylene for the oil companies. Really powerful. This company turns viruses into diagnostics for hospital-acquired infections. If the bug is there, it lights it up. A few weeks ago at Stanford, researchers just start, built a system that allows viruses to do cell-to-cell -cell communication in a controlled way. In other words, they call this not Wi-Fi, Bi-Fi, biological transmission. They can send up to 40 KB of data. Super cool. But Cancer, to me, is where the real fun is. Because viruses are super specific. 
as to which cells they like to infect and run. And cancer, they just have broken hard drives. You know what it's like. The blue screen of death, the computer's not working all that well. That's basically cancer. All we got to do is go kill them. And this is what viruses do. They love to just attack cells and destroy them. This is, this is an E. coli bacterium being infected by a virus that only infects E. coli. You can eat this stuff for breakfast. And in fact, you probably do because they already use this for sterilizing the surface of meats. It's FDA cleared. And groups have been making viruses that hunt down cancer cells for years but they're using the old business model. They still want to make billions of dollars. I think we're going to start seeing cancer-specific viruses pop up in the next few years, designed, open source, funded, open source, and crowdsourced. And I think it's going to be revolutionary for the biotech industry and for antimicrobials. A couple years ago at that competition at MIT, a group of students wrote a 200-page manual on how to do viral gene therapies and anti-cancer agents. So it's pretty much already down at the high school level. And if you're starting to think about biowarfare, et cetera, just remember all of nature is biowarfare. I know how it ends. Eventually we die. I just don't want it to be viruses that kill you that are man-made. I actually think a lot about biosecurity. In fact, I think about it so much, I wrote a story about how to hack the president's DNA and it comes out in the Atlantic next month. It spent a year in fact-checking with the magazines because the scientific community was so up in arms about this. But I think if we're going to build technologies, we have to figure out how to secure them. We learned the hard way with computing that we needed to build an immune system, and we got pretty good at it. It's good industry. I think we have to start thinking about our bioimmune systems out in the world, too, and really the issues XL Foods is, is having in the last couple of weeks kind of drives that point home. But this goes way beyond anything we're comfortable with in biology because now that we can mix and match code from pretty much any living thing, we're going to go to places biology and nature hasn't gone before. Now, you guys are used to that. You build the world. But this is kind of new. We're already doing things like bioprinting. I work with groups that are bio, starting to bioprint tissues for pharmaceutical companies, and eventually you'll get a heart or a lung bioprinted. That's kind of neat. When it gets cheap enough, you'll get steaks bioprinted. Skip the cow. We're making new animals. Most of them are just glow in the dark. <laughs> but they'll get weirder. <laughs> We're hacking aging. The mouse on the left is a normal mouse. The mouse on the right has been genetically engineered so as its cells age, they die off one by one. It didn't live any longer, but it sure looks great. We're resurrecting extinct species. Wow, how cool is that? We're going to do, you know, the woolly mammoth. Maybe we'll resurrect a Neanderthal person. Maybe we'll resurrect Friends, no, let's not go there. Let's not go there. But really, we're starting, nothing has to be extinct anymore. Once we've got the code, it gets interesting. And of course, who here watched this lander, land on Mars? A few hands go up. I was up all night. Uh, this was so cool, just watching the scientists geek out when this thing landed. It's on Mars, and the thing, reason why I love this particular rover is it's a bio lab. You know, this, we might find our first alien creatures in the next few weeks, and they're probably going to be microbes, but how cool is that? Even if they are just microbes. GM foods get a really bad rap, trust me. As a genetic scientist, you don't make a lot of friends. But I think we're going to start ending up with a whole bunch of genetically modified foods people actually want and pay a premium for soon, because it's no longer just the big manufacturers that are just selling to farmers. Now it's going to be artisans, and they'll make things like square apples and stuff like that. By the way, they do that. They just put them in a box. But we don't really know where biochemistry is going to go as we start hacking it. It could be very possible to enzymatically generate diamond, for example. It's just carbon. We already know that enzymes do the coolest chemistry. 
We don't know the limits. Life wouldn't have evolved this. There's no reason for it. But we're going to start evolving these systems in some really interesting ways. My friend Juan Enrique likes to talk about what happens when we start turning these technologies onto ourselves. He says we become a whole new species this century. If I look at kids, most of them already look like a new species to me. <laughs> and then there's the whole idea of synthetics and brain machine interfaces and other things. Really cool stuff. All science fiction, but science fiction generally paves a way to the future. <laughs> Did you see Prometheus? <laughs> David, the android? I love the promo. He's got the corporate logo right in his thumb. I like that. Wayland Yutani. Most of this stuff, though, scares people. But I remember a day not so long ago when people thought computers were going to end up being used for hacking into missile silos and starting World War III. It did something far worse. It created Facebook. <laughs> My point is, we often get the future wrong. This was what the 1950s imagination produced for a home computer. And if, I know you guys, you didn't see Twitter coming. I know that, or you would have made it. It would have taken you 10 minutes. Our worst case, our worst fears are almost never realized. Reality is far stranger than anything we can ever dream up. But I know that we're going into a whole new area where we need the most powerful computers in the world solving problems. And by the way, that's the one in between your ears. So when you think about big data and big problems, I hope you also start thinking about how to keep these systems really human, really good for us. Because they're going to be the ones watching over us. My short story is, bio is the new cyber. But really, it meets in the middle. Keep it good. Thanks. I think we have about 10 minutes for questions, so. This is really very exciting because uh, we will be able to do things that uh, will change our world in ways we do not foresee and we cannot foresee. However, we all programmed and we know some of the side effects of that. Um, and in a world where you have people in their garages doing things with the do-it-yourself bio, um, we cannot dismiss some of these outcomes that uh, could be um, unintentionally evil. So should we and how can we put safeguards to avoid these things? Yep, that's a very good question. So how do we safeguard this stuff? Um, I've been working with the FBI for the last several years. Um, they started an outreach program back in 2008-ish where they started going into these communities and building bridges with these communities because they realized, one, they're not going to be able to stop it. It's kind of like stopping computing. It'll just roll over you. And so they needed to make friends. And what they realized right away is that the, the groups that are putting their hands up and going, I'm a DIY biologist, they're not the ones you have to worry about, but they're the ones you have to learn from, which is really good. Two, you mentioned unintended harm. The FBI knows that things go bad. They only focus on intention. You might create something in the lab that goes out and hurts people, but they'll come and interview you, usually with too much media attention, but they'll ask you, they'll, they'll investigate whether you intended that to happen. Of course, if you intended it, then you go into a prosecution system. If you didn't, the, then they try and, literally, they try and save your career. This is really interesting to me because I think when I think about biosecurity, I remember that there's always been weapons programs, always. Um, we've, 
They used to be dark. Now everything's built on a foundation of computing, so it's actually a lot more transparent than it's ever been. Uh, we do have safeguards in place at DNA synthesis and, of course, just tracking databases. They're not going to be perfect. We're going to learn a bunch of lessons. But I don't think we'll ever get like a pandemic out of this. I think nature is more likely to create the random pandemic. But I do know, and we don't even know how pandemics work anymore in a world with Twitter, by the way. We really don't. Because flus and colds spread slowly compared to tweets. I'm not kidding. And, and so we really don't know how this works. But we're going to have to learn along the way. And I think that the negatives are really small compared to the positives. And that's been the way it has been with almost every technology that, that we've created and, and democratized. So I'm not saying that bad stuff won't happen. But every day, people are thinking about this. More and more groups are tracking electronic systems. We're trying to get better at picking stuff out. And we'll learn from our mistakes, which is really good. Um, but uh, really, I think we should start a few biosecurity companies, too. And they'll look like the NSA. Well, thanks. Maybe as a bit of a follow-on to that, um, we have a bit of an understanding and an appreciation for the value of certain elements of infrastructure to enable what's going on in the cyber side. Could you comment a bit on what you can envision as infrastructure for the bio side? Yeah. Uh, most of the infrastructure is actually on the foundation of computing. Um, it's really hard to read genetic code by eye, for example. I learned that I had to use computers pretty much right away. So, so all of this is built on big data, all of it and sensors uh, and automation. Um, I think that the next layer of infrastructure that's emerging now that's really powerful is, is these biofabs. It's essentially automated biology assembling. So you don't need a lab anymore, so to speak. You can send a design to a fab. They'll make it. They'll test it. They'll send you the data back. Ten years ago, when I left big biotech, um, I, I went to a beach in Thailand because I had no idea where I was going to go for my next step. I'd learned everything that the big companies could teach me. And what I realized was I want to be able to sit on this beach and do genetic engineering um, in the same way that I could program a computer. And that's starting to materialize now because of this infrastructure layer. But it needs to get a lot better, a lot more robust, and, and we need to start finding ways to bring stuff to market. It's really easy to engineer biology now really hard to get it into the, into the world. Uh, so in these fabs, like what, what are the basic raw materials that they use uh, in, the, in the production of, of these things? Uh, well, really, they're, they're, um, it, it's DNA precursors for the, for the DNA fabs. Uh, they, they refine it from cane sugar. It comes in bottles. Bottles of it will make enough of it to synthesize for years. Uh, there's a few other chemistries. Those are really old technologies, and they're starting to get replaced now with enzymatic techniques of DNA synthesis, kind of copying the mechanisms that are already in our bodies. Um, so really, most of these systems, once you, once you get DNA, turning it into a protein or turning it into a virus or even a living cell is, is pretty easy. You just feed them sugar and some nutrients. So they, they grow like we do. So once uh, it's a very clean industry for the most part. And um, the outputs, you know, living things are sustainable as well. Anything that life makes, life can degrade. It's really just some of the harsher chemistries that we've been using in our industrial processes that life kind of looks at and goes, I have no idea what to do with this. <laughs> I find this absolutely fascinating that you've, they're designing all these different life forms based on life, but have you figured out what life is yet? Well, I, I, I've answered that for me a long time ago. Um, you, if, the easiest way for me to describe it is, is, is with yeast. You go into the grocery store and you buy a packet of yeast, you know, just Fleischmann's yeast to go make some bread. 
That's a eukaryotic living, once living organism that's been dried. It's just been freeze dried. So it turns into powder. It's literally a bunch of proteins and carbohydrates. Um, it's not alive. It is literally uh, um, um, just a powder. But you pour it into the bowl and you add a bit of sugar, to, that's its nutrient, and a bit of lukewarm water because it's a eukaryote like us, so it needs like 37 degrees. And it hydrates, and when it hydrates, it boots up and it's alive. So for me, life is just a really beautiful, incredibly complicated living machine that once it's assembled, you can turn on and off just by removing the solvent. It's kind of like, it's kind of like if I pull the battery out of my cell phone, it's dead, right? I put the battery back in, it, it's a living, useful piece of technology. So, so life to me is a complicated technology and our bodies, well, we're made up of a trillion, hundred trillion cells working on, on a network. So we're like the internet, much bigger, right? And that's a complication we, like we don't even understand our own internet and we built it because you start getting emergent effects. But when you get a hundred trillion of these incredibly complicated processors networked up, it becomes something so incomprehensible to us that it seems like magic or we ascribe it to God or whatever. I don't know where the mass came from, but I think we're getting really good at reverse engineering some of these biological mechanisms and the code. And I think our, the way we think about life will shift a little bit as we move forward. I think it'll be, I think it'll be a difficult shift for some people. Um, but I still look at it as magic, really. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious um, with the work you were doing on the viruses attacking cells. I mean, do you see a cure for cancer in the future? I think cancer is the thing that we're going to beat. Um, if you go back 100 years, we didn't worry about cancer so much because you got killed by infections earlier. Um, generally, you know, all it took is a scratch. And if you got a bad bacterial infection, you, you could die. Um, and antibiotics change that. And really, antibiotics, all they do is specifically kill microbes and they don't hurt us. So it's really just about targeted cell killing. It's not hard to do with a microbe or in, because microbes are the oldest creatures on the planet and we're the kind of the youngest. So there's this giant evolutionary distance between the two cells. So you can, and microbes, Microbes have, have defenses even against other microbes. Everything needs microbial defenses, so antibiotics are everywhere. But if you think about a cancer, a cancer is one of your cells that's gone rogue. Like, no two people have the same cancer. So it's never been out in nature. Nature doesn't have any defenses. So we have to use our own tools to kind of identify the differences between the cells. Um, and then we just have to kill it specifically. So it's really an antibiotic problem. It's not the fact that the genome's degraded and stuff like that or that you had one too many Snickers bars or anything. Like it's just, cells go broken all the time. Just like if you have a cloud computing group, like server, you know, computers are always dropping off. You just plug a new one in. That's what biology does. It's just that when you get one that doesn't get recognized as broken and because it proliferates, it can, it can crash the network. I see so many new tools and technologies now that are getting so good at being specific at identifying the differences between a cancer cell and a non-cancer cell that I think we're gonna be able to make N of one, like specific cancer treatments for people at incredibly low cost in the next few years. I'm working to crowdsource that because the easiest way to get something to market is to make it for one person. Like, the FDA doesn't know how to deal with that, right? Like, they, their, their job is to protect society. So as long as the process is kind of approved, I think I can actually end up making medicines for people in a few days. Can you imagine walking into your doctor's office? They're getting really good at scanning stuff now, right? Imagine going in and he says, ah, oh, damn, you got prostate cancer. Uh, yeah, it's about a quarter of a millimeter in size. In about 10 years, this is going to be trouble. But hey, we'll give you a treatment this afternoon that'll specifically knock off those cells. And you won't even notice. You know, come back next week, we'll check. Yeah, that's the way I see cancer going. 
And for people that with more advanced cancers, yeah, we'll throw a whole bunch of combinations at them. But we're going we're gonna to beat cancer before we do anything else in the gene therapy front because it's just specific cell killing. That's a hell of a lot easier than specific cell repair. So yay. <laughs> we'll see. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Oh. Ends with 44, last two digits, 44. And we got a winner up here. Woo and I think we're doing another copy. We have a copy of Abundance Party by Peter Diamandis, the leader who started the X Prize that uh, Andrew just mentioned. So I know there's going to be lots of fun conversation after that. Awesome. Uh, Grab that mic off you, Andrew, real quick there. Oh, no, I just got to see if uh, you and the Siberia folks will let uh, my wife and son watch that. It's the stream of your talk tonight. So, you know, even though he's seven, he's right up the valley. <laughs>
Hello. Are you no, I am not. I'm the tech guy.